Hi everyone, so thanks for joining me today. I am delighted that I am joined by Professor Leslie Thomas KC, who will speak to me from Antigua uh, about his career and his journey. So just by way of introduction, Leslie is a leading expert in claims against the police and other public authorities and claims against corporate bodies with expertise across the full spectrum of civil wrongs, civil litigation, human rights, data and privacy claims. He is an expert in all aspects of inquests and public inquiries, having represented many bereaved families in particular where there has been abuse of state or corporate power. Leslie acts for claimants in judicial review proceedings and other public law proceedings. He regularly acts for clients in the Caribbean region on constitutional law challenges and has represented claimants in clinical negligence and personal injury for the last 20 years. Leslie is ranked in band one in the Chambers and Partners in Tier 1 in Legal 500 for inquests and public inquiries and police law. He is also ranked by Chambers and Partners and Legal 500 in Civil Liberties and Human Rights. Leslie is currently Professor of Law at Gresham College, delivering his lecture series, Hard Choices, The Law's Struggle with Ethical Dilemmas. Now, with that introduction, we are really scratching the surface of Leslie's extraordinary portfolio of work, which we will be looking at today, Um, not covering even close to all of his cases, but you will be familiar with a lot of his work. And of course, we talk about his book. Um, in some detail. So thank you again for joining me and I hope you enjoy this recording. Professor Leslie Thomas, I'm glad to have you share your time with us today to discuss about, you know, your cases, your journey into law. And I suppose that's where we'll start right back to where it all began in terms of your career. What led you into the law? Well, I was always quite argumentative at school. (laughs) And uh, I I think I was a real thorn in the side of many of my teachers. Not, not in a horrible way, but in a way that I was, I would never accept things. I would always be questioning um, their rules. And I, I can see that if you're a busy teacher in a comprehensive school with 35 kids trying to keep control of a class, having to explain every single thing because you have one kid at the back who can be a bit annoying, um, can be quite irrit- irritating, I, I, I suspect. But specifically what led me into law, I, I think the one key event that I remember is being stopped by the police. I was on my way home from school. I would have been about 14 at the time, would have been in a school uniform, had a school blazer on, and had a backpack on my back. And I was walking near my home on a, on a busy high street and... All of a sudden, um, you know, um, the SPG group, that's a special patrol group, which was uh, uh, the territorial um, police group that used to roam the streets of London, I I think, harassing and picking on black kids, pulled up alongside me and four big, burly, white police officers jumped out and uh, stopped me. And the conversation went something like this. Uh, yes, officer, how can I help you? And uh, one of the officers said, you look suspicious. And I don't know why I look suspicious, apart from the fact that I was in a school uniform with a backpack on right. and being a 14-year-old black kid. And then he said, then they went on to say that they want to search me. So I asked why, what, what, why were they wanting to search me, what I had I done, and they said that I fitted the description. You know, his words were, "You fit the description of um, somebody who's committed a domestic burglary." He never told me how I fitted the description, so I can only assume that this domestic burglar must have been about fourteen years old, a black kid in a school uniform Mm -hmm. and with a backpack on. And then they proceeded to um, frisk me. Now. Here's the thing. Back in 1980s London, um, growing up, you were very suspicious of the police, and particularly if they stopped you without any good reason. I don't think these officers had any particularly good reason to stop me. And one of the officers went to put his hand into my pocket, and I stopped him. And the reason why I stopped him, because back then, we were really worried about being planted. 
Yeah. You know, it's very easy for officers to put their hands in your pocket and pull their hand up and say, look what I found. And I, you know, called him out on that. And he, the conversation took a turn for the worse. You know, if you don't do what we say, you'll, you'll be down the station faster than you can think, Sonny. And, um, you know, it just got really hot. And I never felt so humiliated. Mm. You know, there I was on my way home from school uh, on a busy high street at about 4 p.m. in the afternoon, being having my pockets turned out by police officers with everybody looking at me. And at that moment in time, I knew, I knew there and then that I wanted to be a lawyer. I didn't know really? what a barrister was. Yeah. didn't know what a barrister was. I just knew I wanted to hold these officers to account. Mm-hmm. And so what happened to me would not happen to other people. So that, that, that's the earliest wow. memory that I can remember that I wanted to be wow. yeah. to, to go into law. So a really defining moment. And I guess I know that you started off in corporate law. Um, why was that? And, and then you kind of made the change over to more of a, a rights-based practice. Yeah. Um, so I went to university, well, it was Polytechnic at the time. It was Kingston College, now Kingston University in Surrey. And I, there was, I, I really excelled on my um, law degree. Um, I think that's when I found myself and, you know, really enjoyed doing a law degree. Mm. And one of my professors thought promisingly, now I didn't know anybody in the law. Yeah. I didn't have a clue. I, you know, I came from a comprehensive school. You know, my folks had nothing to do with law. My mum was a, a nurse. My dad was a... A, a, a technician for British Telecom, um, um, GPO as it then was called. And um, this professor said to me, look, Leslie, I you know, I think you'd be a really good barrister. Um, I've got a friend who, um, you know, might be able to help you. And so I said, yeah, you know, great. I'll take all the help I can get. And he introduced me to a friend of his, and I'll never forget this man. You know, I, I, I remember him with absolute fondness and he was such a kind soul. His name was Dave Richardson and he was a commercial barrister and I remember turning up and I just thought I was just going to meet um, David I, um, but I turned up and he gave me a pupillage a, a traineeship and my law professor had arranged it all. Now, you know, it, 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 it isn't very equal opportunities um, uh, but things weren't very equal opportunities yeah. back then you know, it was, you know, job, jobs for the boys. And this old boys network, because uh, my law professor and David knew each other from Cambridge, um, they gave, you know, they spoke and uh, my professor said, you know, you want to take on Leslie, I think he's got promise. And he did. And when I was with David, it was all commercial law. And it was a really, um, you know, deep dive in introduction for me into the world of commercial law. And whilst the training was absolutely brilliant, I hated it. Yeah. I thought to myself, every day I used to go into work, you know, where are all the real people? Mm. But I didn't want to be, you know, ungrateful for the opportunity that I had been given. So I got, I, you know, I got my head down, worked hard, got a really good training. And every evening, Right, um, I would to ease my soul. I would um, volunteer at different law centres around London. And so I was literally doing, uh, uh, you know, four law centres a week, a different one on, on a different night every week, yeah. just voluntary work. And that's where I met real people with real problems who needed my help. And I got into, I did a lot of um, social um, security law, you know, welfare benefits. Um, landlord and tenant housing rights and debt actions yeah. and it was do it while I was doing law centre work that I was introduced to police actions and people who had you know had tr- got into trouble with the police and I really enjoyed doing that yeah. so um, but that's how I made the transition and I, <laughs> I've had a lot of luck in my life and being in the right place at the right time one of the legal advice centres that I was working in of an evening as a volunteer was Liberty, 
as it now is. It was yeah, the National right. Council for Civil Liberties at the time. And when I was there, I met at one of their Christmas parties, uh, a, a, a chap came over to me and started speak to, speaking to me, and it was um, Tony Gifford, Lord Gifford, who had been doing the Guildford for Birmingham State. You know, he was doing the miners' strike. And, he, you know, we got talking, and he just said to me, he thought, you know, like, you know, you seem interested in what you're doing. So I explained that I was working for Liberty as a volunteer in the evening. He said, what do you do in the day job? And I told him that I was a barrister or I was a pupil at the time in this commercial set. And he said, what are you doing that for? And he said, um, why don't you come along to and meet meet my my chambers? I didn't know who he was. Yeah. I didn't know he was the head of the chambers. So I, but I took him up in his office and I went there. And they interviewed me. <laughs> and they took me on. <laughs> and this is Wellington Street. So, uh, you know, yeah. I really have been lucky. And then when I got to Wellington Street, there was no looking back because I then start, I was introduced to some of the most progressive lawyers in the country doing amazing work. You know, this was now late 80s, early 90s. It was Thatcher's um, reign, <laughs> Thatcher's government, and they had the poll tax. And I, and I remember doing a load of poll tax and protester cases. And um, that was a real baptism of fire sure. for me to go from commercial law straight into protest work. Yeah. And I suppose just looking at the climate within which you started practising. So you said they're the late 80s, early 90s during Thatcher's reign. And we're all familiar with um, what was happening at that time as well, a very difficult time um, in history. But I'm wondering, as a young black man entering into the legal profession, you know, how did you find it? Did you you mentioned the incident that happened to you when you were fourteen, a young boy, and that kind of paved your way into to law? Was it difficult back then, and have things progressed? I suppose. Okay, so um, let let me come to the the last question. Have things progressed? Yeah, they have progressed. It, 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 it's not the same. Mm-hmm. There's still a long way. Um, I think the professions can go, and that's not just the legal profession. That's all professions, and I'll come back to that if mm-hmm. I may. Yes. But in the in the late eighties, early nineties, the racism I encountered was just horrendous. You know, I would be treated absolutely appallingly by judges. And here's the thing: it, uh, oftentimes, it wasn't clients. You know, clients mm-hmm. were happy. I just had somebody represent them. So I never I never experienced any discrimination or racism um, from from any of my clients in you know the thirty plus years that I've been practicing. It, it would either be um, other practitioners um, and you know what you know what <laughs> I remember I'll give you one example. I remember um, being in court, and there was an opponent. I was doing it was a police action case I was doing, and um, there was an opponent who I thought I got on re- reasonably well with. I'd done many cases against him, but we were very respectful of each other. Why? So I thought, and uh, you know, so he was a well-known opponent of mine, and. We were in court one one afternoon, and we, we had to adjourn for lunch. Yeah. So uh, um, I was with solicitors, and we packed up our stuff to leave the courtroom, and I left. And my solicitor came out of court with me, and we left my opponent and his solicitors and his legal team. And he was representing various police officers in court. And my sister had to go back in because she had forgotten her bag. And when she went back in, she t- what she told me horrified me. She said that when she went back in, um, this barrister who I know, who I knew, was impersonating me and making monkey noises. Wow. And she walked in on him doing that. My goodness! And it, he and his team were entirely shocked that they had been caught. So, you know, um, I, I say that I didn't encounter much racism to my face. Mm. Um, who knows what was happening 
behind my back. So that's one example. And, uh, uh, but, but one of the things that, you know, that, that those are opponents, like you take them in, uh, as and as they come, they, they don't really bother me. You, you know, I do my fighting in court. But what's more significant and more impactful is the role of the judiciary. Yeah. And as a young black man uh, and as a young black lawyer, the racism I encountered from the judiciary was terrible. I remember my very first case, my very first case in court. I was doing a an in, um, it was an injunction against a client of mine on a family case, and it, so it was a matrimonial dispute. And um, I think I was just sitting there with the father, and his wife had taken out an injunction against him in a domestic violence type case. And I remember going into court, I remember this was my, you know, they used to send junior lawyers on these, you know, sort of like domestic mm -hmm. disputes where you try to get uh, the husband back into the household or uh, get, get, get an order for the husband to see the kids. So it's one of those typical family type disputes. I, I wasn't really a family practitioner, but it was the very first case that I had done and I accepted it. I went into court and I um, introduced my client to the judge who kind of grunted at me. And then I said, um, you know, you're on arm here, Rexton in Dad. And the judge exploded. Dad! Dad! You don't use that term in my court! I'm thinking to myself, what have I said? Well, I said that's wrong. And he proceeded to berate me and screamed at me and went red in the face. And, you know, um, <laughs> when I look back on it now, um, I went back to my chambers and was told, uh, oh, well, you know, perhaps you should have used the expression father. father. Right? Yeah, I get that. <laughs> but I'm, I'm telling you, the reaction was so extreme. And the way that this judge was conducting himself with me, myself and my opponent, who was white, the, the difference was noticeable, so noticeable. And, you know, yeah, you know, maybe your listeners will be listening to this and say, well, you know, how, what's that got to do with your colour? You know, I know. I know that the, di the differential treatment that I received um, from this judge, yeah. um, there was much more to it sure. than the fact that I had just used the expression. I'd called um, this father dad. Yeah, unbelievable. Gosh, such an extreme reaction. But you do give, and um, we'll talk about your, your book now uh, shortly, Leslie. And there are examples in your book that really just blew my mind in terms of, you know, that we don't really hear and we don't understand. And I think we're guilty of saying, well, you know, there's certain incidents, but the system itself just seemed to be intrinsically uh, racist, you know, from in, in very many ways. Um, and you do talk about instances that affected you and, of course, your clients as well when they appeared before. Um, the judiciary but just looking at your book which is really excellent you've the title do right and fear no one i'm interested in finding out how you chose that title um well the title is i'm, I'm a member of garden court chambers and um we've had for many years i think it was owen davis who was a former head of chambers and um, chose that as our motto do right and fear no one. And I just thought that just epitomizes the, the, the work and my life as a lawyer and as a barrister in, in the um, English bar. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you, you know, choosing to do right, choosing and choosing to do right isn't just the cases you choose. It's not just the fact that you're choosing progressive cases. Sure. Um, but it's also the way that you conduct yourself when you do those cases and choosing to do so with integrity. Mm -hmm. And the fear no one, it, there, there have been so many times when I've been really fearful of going into court, 
But, you know, when you're doing right for your client, you just have to put your fears behind you, even though you're taking on the might of the state, and just step up. Because oftentimes, your client, and I've been in many, what I describe as David versus Goliath battles, is the little person Mm. who has to take on the might of the state. And often the only thing between your client and the might of the state protecting them is you. Mm -hmm. And and your skill as a lawyer, uh, um, trying to get what's right for them all to protect them. And uh, there have been so many cases, Sarah, where I, you know, just take some of the deaths in custody where you really are taking on the might of the state. Yeah. You're, you know, you're taking on so many different branches of the state, whether that be um, the police, police chiefs, home office, um, prison service, uh, uh, medical facilities, psychiatric hospitals. Sometimes, in one case, you have all of these bodies, yeah. all of these bodies, and all singing from the same hymn sheet against you and your client. Yeah. And, and you just think the, the system is meant to be, you know, meant to have due process and meant to be inherently fair. But how can you say the system is fair when you've got the full arm of the system state and all the resources behind the state against an individual or a small family yeah. who might not have the resources um, to take on the full arm Absolutely. of the state. Yeah. And, and that's when you really do have to be fearless and step up to protect your clients. Yeah, and some of, I mean, we'll talk about some of your cases in more detail. Um, your book covers a lot of the police action work that you did um, and taking on um, state authorities and all of those that you mentioned. But I must just say, you know, looking at your book and you go through a number of the cases that you work on in great detail, but um, and just to mention some of them, Christopher Alder, the Birmingham Six Grenfell, the, the deaths of Bobby, um, Christy and Bobby Shepherd as well, which really brought me back because I remembered hearing about the case loosely. But really, um, within those short, relatively short chapters, you really put, you know, the victim and their, their families really front and centre of that. Um, you've spoken about taking on uh, the Goliath, the wealth of the, the, the state against you. And I'm just wondering um, how you're able to, as one person, dedicate yourself so fully to those incredibly complex difficult cases where you have even the media is against you in very much of your cases you reference how the media would have twisted um, arguments and really um, came down on, on your victims and family members like a ton of bricks. How do you manage to deal with that and are you able to um, it was one of the questions when I was looking at just does Leslie ever switch off was he ever able to you know take a break and separate yourself from your work because you did have case after case after case and many of them were high profile. This job, this vocation, um, because it's more than a job, I suppose, Mm -hmm. takes its toll. And there have been times when I felt that I've been pushed so close to the edge that your sanity um, feels like it's been being impacted. And there have been several times when that's happened to me where... um, I've given my all and I've had no more to give. What what they don't teach you at law school is you're not just a lawyer yeah. when you do these cases. You become so much more. You become a social worker. You become a counsellor. You become a therapist. I, now, I don't have those skills. I've not been trained in those skills. But you need those skills in terms of you know dealing with grief bereavement, pain of your client. Uh, and, you know, you do take on the trauma of your clients. You know, so some of the cases that you've mentioned um, you have been highly trauma, traumatic cases. So, you know, take the Birmingham Six. Mm. Uh, I did the 
second inquest in 2017, I believe, 2017, 2018, something like that. And where, you know, the families of the um, Birmingham pub bombings were trying to get to the truth as to who knew what, when, whether the police could have done more to prevent this atrocity um, occurring back in 1974. So you're, 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 you're dealing with real historic trauma going back a number of years. Yeah. And, you know, you know some, some of the families are extremely angry and have that pain built up in them. That's just one example. Another example is I was involved and represented many of the Hillsborough families who died in the Hill, Hillsborough Stadium disaster. Again, you know, real, you know, a, 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 a mass disaster, mass trauma. Uh, Grenfell, the Grenfell fire disaster. So, you know, you, you, you cannot do these cases if you are, if you have any empathy and humanity and not be touched by the pain of, of, of your clients. Yeah. So to answer your question, does it impact me? Of course it does. Mm. How do I cope? Well, um, when I'm in a case, it's very difficult because one of my faults is I live, breathe, think, sleep the cases. What, if, what impact has that had on my life, my personal life? Well, you know, I've um, got a failed marriage behind me. <laughs> and, you know, the reality is that if I, if I think about my... Uh, uh, you know, um, first marriage. One of the difficulties that I think is I devoted a lot of my time, too much of my time, um, on clients and away from home. Yeah. Um, and, and that, I, you know, if I'm being honest with myself, I think that that played a significant part in in, in, in my relationship failing. So, and, and that's me telling you walk them all. Yeah. But the reality of it, I spend I spend a lot of time now. Right, a lot of time now. I spend taking time out. I don't have a back to back cases like I used to. And one of the things that really eases my soul is music. I'm a saxophonist, wow. so I play I I play music, and that really I, I'm a jazz. Saxophonist, and I, and I just l love jazz music and playing and, and playing my saxophone. But, but you, you know that really eases myself. And I try to travel. I get away from the um, UK as much as I can. Um, you know, just to, I, I I don't like being recognised, and uh, you know I I, I find, I'm finding increasingly that I am being recognised, and that's simply because there's, there aren't that many black. Um, King's Council yeah. uh, around, so you, you do become known. Yeah. Well, some of the cases that you have worked on, um, again, very high profile cases concerning, and many of them concerning inquests into unlawful killings. Some of them you didn't, and you know, the family members wouldn't have had the outcome that they perhaps wanted. And I mean, I think it's astonishing reading in your books, um, the family members of the victims themselves just seem to be, they've campaigned tirelessly, even after they lost a case. And it's just so, you just look at these people and wonder how did they muster up the energy to do this? But in some of your cases, even when it seemed like and reading them, the odds were completely stacked against you, whether it was due to perceived feelings within the system, the legal process, which we've spoken a little bit about, but also based on previous cases and previous experiences um, in terms of, um, suppose I'm alluding more to, more so to the, um, the police action cases and the deaths in custody as well. But how does it feel to win one of those cases? Because after you've won them, there, ha you, 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 there have been changes within the system and incremental changes as well. But how does that feel both personally and I suppose collectively in terms of the law taking action based on what you've done? Yeah, um, so <laughs> um, elated, mm. um, you know, absolute joy for my clients. The fact that um, I might have 
played some tiny part in getting some accountability for them. But often, when when we've had a success in one of these cases, real sadness, because at the heart of every victory, yeah. uh, particularly on these police cases, you, you have the sobering thought but this is as a result of somebody's life being taken unlawfully. And so you have to check yourself. You know, you, you, know, you have all this elation in the moment. Yeah. Sorry, that was a bit, my name is dog. <laughs> That's okay. You have, you, you, you have this elation in the moment yeah. that um, there's been, you know, real success. Mm-hmm. And then you, you, you're, you're that, you have that sobering thought, that really sobering thought that somebody died mm-hmm. and so, and it's not just died they died at the hands of the state and perhaps the state has tried to cover up so, l- l- let me give you an example I, I yeah, think please. one case that really um, comes to mind is um, the death of Sean Rigg mm. Sean, Sean died at the hands of Brixton police officers um, I, I believe in something like 2008, and we did the inquest in 2012. And so many cock-ups on the part of the state in the investigation, just just botched, mm. botched investigation. And one of the ways that the investigation was botched, you know, Sean was a young man who had a mental health crisis. You know, um, he was really unwell on the street, um, you know, acting very bizarrely, uh, members of the public um, called the police who came, restrained him, took him to Brixton Police Station. At Brixton Police Station, he dies. He collapses and dies. And the question is, how does a man, okay, he's got mental health problems, but otherwise very physically fit, how does a young man, uh, or relatively young man, suddenly collapse and die at a police station? And... What the police were saying in this case, and here's the thing, and this shows just how botched the investigation was, the official investigation was before the family got involved. They said, oh, well, we checked all the CCTV cameras, and Sean um, was fine at the police station, and his collapse was sudden and unexpected. And so one of the things that you would hope that the police watchdog, the uh, independent police complaint um, commission at the time, now the IOPC, Independent Office of Police Conduct, one of the things that you would hope they would do is check the CCTV. Yeah. You know, you seize the CCTV at a police station and you just don't seize it. You watch it. Well, unfortunately, um, you know, the family fought for ages to get hold of CCTV. When they eventually got it, they decided to crunch it themselves and watch the 15 different camera angles at the um, of the police CCTV, and what they saw shocked them, because it was absolutely apparent that the police watchdog had not watched the CCTV. And here's the reason why: the custody officer, the custody officer, made it clear that um, he had gone and looked at Sean when Sean was in the police van. What the CCTV showed was the custody officer never left the police station. And despite the fact that he had said, Don checked him in, he was fine, he looked at me, I looked at him, and um, you know, I, I, I had no concern. It was absolutely clear that this custody officer had never left the police station and had lied about that. When that came out in the inquest, when the family discovered that themselves, and when that came out in the inquest, everybody was so shocked. The custody officer couldn't give an explanation. The CCTV spoke for itself. Yeah. He had, it showed that he didn't leave the police station. And in the end, he was charged with perjury. Now, that only came about because the family decided to look at hours and hours and hours of CCTV evidence that the police watchdog didn't bother to look at. My goodness. Unbelievable. And, and, 
and, and so so you you, you asked to have him. You, obviously, we felt really elated. We got a fantastic um, verdict or um, conclusion on Sean's mm-hmm. case. It was great, but what's the family to think? You know, where is the accountability? The police watchdog aren't doing their job. They're not holding the police to account. And here's a young man that died when he should not have died no. in the most horrific, horrific circumstances. Unbelievable. You do um, give some details of, of similar cases as well, and uh, they're truly astonishing. Um, but I will say, your book, although it focuses on the legal aspects and, um, you know, you look very often at coroner's inquests as well, and we get a, a taste and a flavour of the different types of coroners that you've worked with as well. Um, but it's also a very much a personal coming-of-age book, so it's not just for lawyers. I mean, anybody would be interested in reading about your journey as well. But just to put the legal hat on a little bit, you've worked extensively extensively on coroners and quests, as I've said, uh, before and after the Human Rights Act came into place um, in the late 90s, early 2000s. And just, um, I mean, legal aid funding is always an issue. It still is um, an absolute abomination when it comes to accessing justice. But Article 2, and it's been very important with cases here, we've had solicitors on talking about their legacy cases as well. I know it's formed a major part of some of your work. At the moment, we know that the Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, British Prime Minister, is talking about getting rid of ECHR, dropping out of it, having nothing to do with it again, using immigration um, the same way they did when they were arguing for Brexit. Um, But, I mean, I suppose my first question is, how did the Human Rights Act um, improve the system when it comes to coroner's inquests? That's only one aspect of the law that it might have improved um, in terms of funding and in terms of, um, you know, people being able to access full disclosure, for example, which wasn't always the case before that was in place. And also, um, how important is it to ensure mechanisms like the ECHR remain intact? I think people kind of fluff over it a little bit, but really all of our rights are at uh, risk if mechanisms like that are, um, you know, done away with by the government. It's a, it's a really good question. And let, let me let me take it in turn. You see, I, I, I'm going to start with your last question first, because I think that's the fundamental question. And then I'll mm. come and, sh- and I'll explain how the, the Human Rights Act has impacted inquests. What we, what we need to understand and have at the front of the mind and what the government is trying to um, obscure with sleight of hand is that the Human Rights Act is for everyone. You can't choose, you can't pick and choose yeah. um, the human rights that you, you know, that you like. You can't just have rights um, that you think are popular and ignore rights that may be unpopular. Rights are rights. Mm. And so what we need to bear in mind at all times is what might be unpopular today might be popular tomorrow and vice versa. Yeah. And so you, you, you really can't say, oh, we've got too many um, you know, asylum seekers coming in, let's try to control our borders. Uh, and will take their rights away because taking those rights away will have um, repercussions that you can't even think of that affect each and every one of us. And I think with the government taking this populist um, uh, view, very narrow-minded view on rights-based laws, is just it is it, it, it's just appalling. Yeah. How? Uh, let, I'm speaking in the abstract. Let, let me just bring it down on a real level so people can understand, your listeners can understand how the Human Rights Act has really affected just ordinary people, people like you and I. Before 2000, before the Human Rights Act came into force, it, it's 1998, but it didn't come into force in, in, in the um, uh, United Kingdom until... Uh, uh, um, October 2000, there was no legal aid, for example, for inquests. There was no right to disclosure at inquests. There was no level playing field. So you might lose a loved one, right, at the hands of the police. And remember, don't assume for one moment that your loved one has to be doing something wrong. Oftentimes, in many of the cases that I'm involved in, Loved ones are doing nothing wrong. They are they are entirely innocent victims. 
bystanders. Hillsborough, the people were entirely innocent um, football supporters and it was botched, yeah. entirely botched policing that didn't um, manage the pens. And I know that there was all that defunct um, nonsense about it being Liverpool fans. It had nothing to do with Liverpool fans. It was to do with botched policing. Now, but for, but for the Human Rights Act, there would have been no disclosure to those families. They would have had no right of legal aid. They would have had to have attended. Remember, the Hillsborough inquest lasted two years. Who can afford, who can afford, what ordinary person can afford to um, instruct lawyers for two years um, unfunded? Yeah. Whereas the state agencies, the, the police forces, the football stadiums, you know, the, all, all the Goliaths with big money, deep pockets can afford to attend a two-year-long inquest to fight, get to the bottom. Those, those Hillsborough families, which ended up with an unlawful killing verdict, would never have had that justice but for the Human Rights Act levelling the playing field, allowing them to have proper representation. I remember before the Act, I used to go along to inquests with nothing but a but a piece of paper telling me who my clients were. Yeah. Didn't have any of the witness statements from the state, didn't have any of their um, um, documents, didn't have any of their notebooks, didn't, didn't have anything. And they would turn up with bundles of documents of all their notes. And I would, I, I would be cross-examining or questioning the witnesses blind. Oh that is what it was like before the Human Rights Act. And it's difficult to imagine... But that, that was only 20 years ago. Yeah. Unbelievable. And you think of the lay litigants as well, who did, you know, take it upon themselves to act without any legal guidance and they had no access to funds and maybe that's why they did it. It's an absolute, you know, failure on um, the part of the justice system. But yeah, well, here we are with the Prime Minister threatening to, to remove this from all of us, um, which is no uh, big secret. This has been going on for some time. So hugely important that we emphasise uh, the need to protect that mechanism for all of us. I'm just wondering as well about your cases, a lot of them concerning police brutality and the details of which are absolutely astonishing, as well as the deaths in police custody in the UK. How did you feel when you heard about the news of George Floyd, which we know was um, you know, viral across the world and still resonates with all of us who at that time, a difficult time as it was, um, you know, considered that horrific case? How did that make you feel just in terms of your clients that maybe you had been working with at that time and your past clients who suffered the exact same thing? We talk about positional asphyxia as one of the issues that you would have raised that the police and those against you would have disputed. But there we have George Floyd filmed on camera and everybody got to see what in fact happened. I, I, I have mixed feelings about George Floyd's death, right? Firstly, it was the most horrendous death that you could watch captured on cct well captured on the phone yes, camera yeah. yeah captured on the phone camera showing this young man dying pleading for his mother as he died and, and as those police officers squeezed the life out of him absolutely horrendous but so i have to be honest with you there was nothing new there for me yeah. i know that for a lot of people that was new and shocking mm. but that for the past 30 years has been many of the cases that I have been involved in. Exactly, yeah. You know, the way George, the way George Floyd died, I've done so many cases before 2020 when George Floyd died, where people have died in similar circumstances. Wayne Douglas, that was in 1996. Uh, Sean Rigg, 2012. Christopher Older yeah. in 1998. You know, all, all of these people died. Uh, in similar circumstances, Wayne Douglas was recorded or, and reported to have been saying, I can't breathe. Ibrahim Assay, who died, he was one of the first people who died from the use of um, CS spray in this, in, 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 in this country. He was saying um, and was recorded as saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. So yeah. nothing new. Kevin Clark, Kevin Clark, who died in 2016. In other words, four years, four years before George Floyd, I did his inquest in um, 
2020. Yeah. So after George Floyd, uh, and on police body cam, yeah. um, Wayne, Wayne Clark is recorded to be saying, I can't breathe. Yeah. So these cases, you know, uh, and this mode of death, positional asphyxia, and I should say this, positional asphyxia is a mode of death where somebody is placed inevitably on their front in the prone position, face down, and pressure is applied to their back, you know, either police officer's knee or holding them down, and it in, impacts the mechanical mechanisms of, uh, of breathing, so you can't breathe, yeah. and they asphyxiate, essentially. That's the mode of death. That's all that position of asphyxia. You asphyxiate, but because of the position you're being held in, and that mode of death has been well known in the UK for years. Yeah. Uh, ever since I've been doing these cases in the mid, you know, um, early nineties, mid nineties, we've had positional asphyxia, and so for it to become to the na- international international um, function um, mm. is, is a good thing, but it just makes me think. You know, I hear so many people thinking saying to me, well, Leslie, we're not like America. Yeah. You know, we're not like the United that. States. You know, you know we, yeah. we don't have those types of... And I say to them, well, excuse me, I've made an entire career mm. dealing with these cases. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and people can't... Do we have so many they deaths can't in get, our country? Yeah. I think you're so right. Yes, and, we do. Uh, yeah, and it was only when I read the details of your case when it mentioned position as, as asphyxia, sorry, and you could see the defences immediately, well, there's an underlying condition, that's why it happened, and that's why the person, that was normally their kind of, you know, uh, point of reference. But I kept thinking of the George Floyd case, even when I was reading them and thinking, wow, this has been happening, as you said, you know, for years and probably still continues. The fact that it, I suppose it was filmed there and it has given rise to a movement, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, and you would hope, as you said, that there is in international attention on this issue but of course this has been going on it's not confined to the US police brutality as well is not confined to the US and you um, rightly so have witnessed that and um, unfortunately many of your clients and their families Um, just on that do you feel the Black Lives Matter movement has made an impact or I mean it came at a time with Brexit? Yes so my view about the Black Lives Matter movement is firstly um, it was (laughs) I remember Black Lives Matter um, when it first started in 2016, 2017, but it really came to a fall in in the what I described as the COVID years, yeah. um, 2020, 2021, and it really made, particularly our nation, take a long, hard look at itself and racial injustice. So to that extent, um, I think it's been a really good thing, yeah. right? Um, the way it, it picked up traction in 2020. Um, so that's good. However, what worries me is I think there's been, you know, racial justice fatigue mm. in the sense that, you know, do, do you remember all those really fantastic statements, public statements that corporations and individuals and bodies, you know, uh, were making about being anti-racist or, what, you know, becoming an anti-racist organisation, embracing the Black Lives Matter um, uh, themes and everything. Yeah. Has a lot changed? Yeah. No, I don't think so. I, I think there has been a fatigue and I think it's easy to say words. Yeah. What's more difficult is to produce action. Yeah. And I, I, I would like to see a lot more action because I still think there's a lot of um, racial injustice and there mm. really still needs to be a, 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 a great levelling of the playing field. Yeah, and we can see that really well and it's really well highlighted as well in your submissions around the Grenfell Grenfell Tower case, which of course we know happened on the 14th of June 2017, where 72 residents in a 24-storey residential block in Kensington, North Kensington I think, um, lost their lives. And the beginning of your book, I find it really interesting that you set out a very grim situation for the black community in England in the 1960s, 70s in terms of tenancy and housing. Irish people have been included in that as well 
well in terms of there was basically it was a free for all when it came to uh, landlords and they could charge whatever they want people were uh, um, evacu- um, evicted from their homes it was just it sounded like a horrendous place to be and years later decades later you find yourself coming from knowing a system that was discriminatory and racist to the core and decades later you are appearing before the Grenfell Tower inquiry Um, stressing some parallel themes, race and state obligations. Again, the COVID-19 inquiry could fall into that as well. George Floyd, the issue around there that was brought up at that time as well. But why, I suppose it's an obvious question, but you mentioned fatigue there as well. And why is it so important in your submissions that the inquiry itself and I suppose all, all, all types of inquiries um, do not shy away from the issues of racism and the systemic inequality when considering the submissions before them. And I think the inquiry is still ongoing, but you really stress the need for the inquiry to consider that core issue as part of their entire consideration. Why is that still important to really stress that and if there is to be any meaningful outcome of this matter? Because you cannot ignore the the elephant in the room. Mm. So if we take the Grenfell Tower inquiry, um, I don't think it's coincidental that in one of the most, um, one of the richest boroughs in the country, Mm. Kensington, that you've got a a pocket where you've got a a diverse group of people. You couldn't have a more diverse group of people than the Grenfell residents. When you look at the numbers and the statistics of the number of black and brown people who died, it's shocking. Mm -hmm. It's shocking that in, you know, you know, in the 21st century, in one of the richest parts of the country, so many black and brown people died. Mm -hmm. I think that's the elephant in the room. And I don't think you can say that you're having an inquiry and not ex- properly explore whether uh, institutional racism played a part. Yeah. Now, okay, it, 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 look into it. If you come to the conclusion it p- played no part, then so be it. But you just can't ignore it. Take the COVID inquiry, which I'm involved in. I'm representing currently a group of um, ethnic minority um healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, um, social workers, you name it, they they work in the NHS or in the healthcare system. Um, I'm representing a group called FEMHO, Federation of Ethnic Minority Healthcare Organisations. And one of the things that that, that they make during the COVID years in 2020, the first 10 doctors to die were black. The first 10 doctors to die were black. Gosh. Uh, Now, (laughs) the one thing we know, there's nothing about the the physiology of, you know, being black, which caused their death. We can can eliminate that. And we know that um, because uh, in other countries, particularly in countries which are predominantly black, you don't have the same statistics. Mm -hmm. Why is it in in this country, which is a predominantly white country, that you've got such a disproportionate number of black and brown people who died? And the answer is very simple. The answer is very straightforward. And I appreciate the inquiry is still doing its job, but what we say is you had more black and brown people disproportionately on the front line mm. being exposed to the virus. So there's no, there's, there's no magic, there's no mystery to it. Yeah. You know, um, and many of my clients will say things like that, um, you know, uh, nurses, doctors, um, healthcare workers of colour were being put on the front line or you had them disproportionately on the front line. That is what, so they had greater exposure to the virus. Absolutely. That is why they died. And the question is, why, why, given the fact that we had this unknown virus back in the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, um, when it was becoming very clear that this was a, 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 a very dangerous virus, why were 
they're not sufficient protection being offered to those who are most at risk. Yeah. And those who are most at risk was disproportionately black and brown people. And the stats speak for themselves. Absolutely. So, but it's, it's, for me, it's quite simple. It's the elephant in the room. And if you're having an inquiry and, you want, and you're saying you're going to be looking at this, you cannot ignore yeah. the obvious. Mm-hmm. Now, throughout your work as well, and some of those high profile cases and the inquiries that you're working on, you have spoken about uh, trespasser syndrome. And I'm wondering what you mean by that and how it affects you. You've been very open and candid about your personal life and how your work has impacted it. What do you mean by that? So trespasser syndrome, well, most people will have heard the expression imposter syndrome, where, you know, you feel um, that, should I be here? Um, I I don't believe I belong here. Um, You have to pinch yourself. You know, you get you, you, you get to a position in life, and you you, you, you can't, can't quite believe that you are that you are the right person to do that job. Mm. And to an extent, I felt like that often when I was in the you know halls of the inner temple, uh, walking along the corridors of the um, um, you know um, Supreme Court of Justice or whatever. You, you know, I see myself as a black working class boy who somehow made it into these lo- into a really lofty profession. But then I realised, hang on a second, I'm not an imposter. I've got, you know, I, 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 see the problem about in, the, the, the expression imposter syndrome, and I'm not saying that there isn't a place for the expression imposter yeah. syndrome, because some people genuinely feel like it, but there's a difference between imposter syndrome and trespasser syndrome. And the difference... Um, when I coined the expression trespasser syndrome, I meant it in this way. Imagine you have a table that you're inviting people to sit around to have a meal, right? If you suffer from imposter syndrome, you feel that for some reason there's something wrong, implicit with you that you don't have a right. I shouldn't be sitting at this table. I'm not worthy yeah. to sit at the table and break bread with you. But I realise that the problem is not with me. It's how I'm perceived, made to feel often in my journey at the bar. I've been made to feel that I'm a trespasser. Mm. That, you know, so the, the problem is not with me. The problem is, is with others and how they perceive me. They somehow see me as a trespasser, trespasser that I don't have a right to sit down at the table with them and break bread. Yeah. I prefer that definition because that is how I've been made to feel. And I find trespasser syndrome more empowering because I realise, no, the problem isn't with me. Yeah. I don't have a problem. The problem is with you who don't want me at the table. Mm. So it's a way of empowering, um, think, you know, yeah. minoritised groups, whether that be women, uh, um, you know, people based on gender or religious religions or indeed race yeah. to feel that you, you have a right to be at the table you have a right to break bread mm-hmm. and don't make others um, feel that you don't belong yeah. because the problem is not with you the problem is with them Brilliant. thank you for explaining that I hadn't come across the term before but I think that's it's so interesting I suppose just leading on from that uh, question if anybody was interested in following your footsteps and getting into the line of work that you started off doing, would you recommend it? And um, what advice would you give? It's a great career. It's a fantastic job. It's hard. Mm. It's not easy. Um, if you want to go into rights-based law, protest law, you don't do it if you want to. <laughs> if you want to make a ton of money. <laughs> Certainly don't. You know, uh, if, if you if you want to make a ton of money, you go into you commercial stick to the corporate, law. Yeah, you stick to the corporate. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I would I would say and I would say to anybody who's interested in doing it, it's such a rewarding career. I've had so much enjoyment from some of the results, but it's it's tough. Mm. What? How to go about? If anybody is interested, what should they do? There's a number of things you can do to position yourself to, to be more successful. Firstly, you need to show genuine interest. And so I'm often approached by um, 
lawyers young in their career and they say, um, how do I go about it? I want to do the work you do. And I say, well, what have you done? How have you shown an interest? Because experience matters. Yes, you can have sh new shiny degrees and results, good, good results and good academics, but academics will only take you so far. Mm. To do this work, you really have to show a genuine interest. And what I say to people is, you've got to get involved. There are so many organisations, there's so many campaigns, there are so many people who need help, you know, volunteers. And if you say to me, oh, I'm not, I, I haven't come across any groups or organisations, I say you haven't looked. Because you don't need to go to the group, the, you don't need to go abroad, you don't need to go to the International Court of, um, um, you know, Human Rights, you don't need to go uh, to do death penalty work in the United States, you don't need to go to the ECHR in Europe, you don't need to do, or you, you can do good work on your own doorstep, there's so many um, campaign groups yeah. in your own community that need help. You just need to open your eyes and look. look for them. Absolutely. Great advice. And on that, I guess, the government, but the derogatory comments that we're all familiar with now from um, members well, of the well, British government. Lawyers. Yeah, lefty lawyers, activist lawyers. We had a few on yeah. saying they were called fat cat lawyers, all the rest of it, doing this line of work. So the anti-lawyer rhetoric, rhetoric, I suppose, hasn't gone away. It still continues. Yeah. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on this vilification of lawyers. And it actually has led to real severe threats against lawyers for doing their job, human rights lawyers, immigration lawyers in particular. Um, you know, how concerned are you about that? I am concerned about it because I think it's dangerous rhetoric. Mm. But let's face it, it's not new. No. Um, you know, in the 30s, um, fascist organisations were highly critical of lawyers. Um, in the 40s, 50s, and even in, you know, post-communist Russia, they attack lawyers. Lawyers are an easy target, and it's a real shame and pity that our government should embrace that rhetoric. But, they, but you know, let's, let's face it, they know what they're doing. Yeah. Um, it's because lawyers who do the work that I do hold governments to account, mm -hmm. and, they, and all governments no matter what their complexion, do not like being held to account. Absolutely, yeah. Well, this question, our final question that we ask most of our guests, um, doing the line of work that you do um, in similar other areas, activism and the law, do they go together? And how do you, is it important that you do work in the area that you work in, I guess, as a lawyer, but also, you know, does activism feed into that in terms of making real change? I mean, it's hard to separate the two, and I'm just wondering what your thoughts are around the importance of the two or whether they are separate. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I don't think they necessarily go together because I know many lawyers who do human rights work but who represent government. Mm. And so it would be um, anti-human rights work or limiting human rights or restricting human rights Still human rights work, but from the other side. So it's not necessarily, um, you know, you doing this work that you do it from a certain perspective. Uh, I think it matters. I think what what I feel, what I believe, makes me a better lawyer. It certainly makes me a more passionate lawyer. Passion makes a very big difference in certain cases. So when I'm doing my police work, if I'm in front of a jury, let's say, on a police action, it makes all the difference yeah. um, in terms of results. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. And all I can say is, it's anecdotal for me, but I've got 30 years experience that says it makes a difference. Well, Leslie Thomas, thank you so much 
for sharing your thoughts with us today. It's been fascinating to talk to you and fascinating to read your book. Um, I hope your case in Antigua goes really well and we look forward, yeah, thank forward thank to you. following your work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you, Sarah. Thanks everyone for joining me today. If you like the show, please remember to share and leave a review if you have a moment. And you can also check out our website, www.activistlawyer.com, where you will see some blog articles written by our guests and contributors, as well as some fabulous Activist Lawyer merchandise. This podcast was recorded in Granite Podcast Studio. Interested in starting up your own podcast, but don't know how? Granite Podcast Studio can help. Record your podcast in our state-of-the-art studio, which is based in the heart of Newry City. Our studio has cutting-edge and user-friendly technology and can seat up to four people. We also provide an editing service for our team using your guidance and editing notes to provide you with a flawless finished product, leaving your listeners wanting more. For more information on how you can get started, visit www.granitepodcaststudio.com.